Okay, uh, I guess thanks for everyone for being here. Um, my name is Jennifer Lynn. I lead the product management for the Contrail team at Juniper. And this is uh, our sponsor session. So what I'm going to do uh, in this is essentially I'll give a little bit of uh, what we're seeing in the, in the overall marketplace and talk specifically about Open Contrail, which as many of you know is uh, an open source project uh, that um, we started when we actually GA'd uh, Contrail into the open source community. Um, give a little bit of an update, kind of what's going on there. We've made some uh, enhancements that I'd like to make sure I review with the team here. Um, and also talk about a little bit about the market more broadly. I was in uh, Dusseldorf, Germany two weeks ago at the SDN NFE World Congress. Um, and that's obviously a very different forum than this group here. Um, but a lot of the discussions and a lot of the learnings and a lot of the uh, you know, questions that are coming up, I, I wanted to make sure that we uh, leave time at the end and just get a little bit of uh, feedback from, from the folks here as well. So for those that don't know, I think there's been a lot of talk about, well, you know, what, what problem are we solving? And a lot of these things for, for us at the, in the Contrail team haven't really changed, but obviously there is a lot of change going on, not just in the networking industry, um, but in the IT industry more broadly. So this discussion about old IT and new IT, um, I, I think is very relevant. From a network perspective, moving from this model of device level configuration to system level automation is a fairly large change. Um, we've seen controller based architectures before, but I was just in the panel uh, around uh, Neutron, and I, I think the question about overlays is uh, not really a question anymore. I think people are embracing overlays, but there are still some gaps between what an overlay can do and what it needs to do as part of a broader network system. One of the questions that came up in that panel is I don't want something that specific to a data center implementation. I want this to work on a global basis, but I need to be able to localize the policies. I need to be able to localize the identity stores. I need to be able, that's the exact balance that we want to kind of uh, talk about here with how do we build a hierarchical architecture that enables distributed applications to kind of do a lot of this automation that we're doing here. Um, the other, you know, major change for, for the networking industry is suddenly everybody's embracing open source technologies. Obviously, uh, when, when OpenStack started, and it continues to be one of the largest open source projects in the industry, uh, but for the networking industry overall, open source was not necessarily uh, mainstay. I think, you know, a lot of the open initiatives, whether it's Open Daylight, um, I'm on the board of Open Daylight for Juniper, um, OPNFV, which Juniper is also a founding member and a platinum sponsor, um, you know, obviously OpenStack. A lot of the standards-based uh, initiatives in the past were an open industry dialogue, but it's obviously a very different landscape. How do we get to this model of exposing vendor agnostic APIs to enable an ecosystem to play together? That's fairly different for the networking industry. Um, from a Contrail perspective, we serve three very distinct segments. Um, and I think the sort of uh, deployment cycles, the adoption cycles are actually quite distinct. So we make a big difference between the, the types of customers that are somewhat greenfield, maybe some of the SaaS providers who are building their own applications, um, and they have a little bit more flexibility in terms of the application environment. For many of the traditional enterprise, their version of a virtual private cloud is really to enable IT as a service. E even at Juniper, we're building our core services on an OpenStack cloud. We do our development on our own technology. It allows the developers to move with more agility. I think open source is one key piece of that, and it was something that you know our development team uh, really wanted to do to kind of keep the pace, but it's also uh, the transparency and the engagement with the broader community, and as it grows, we're seeing that as a, a real proof point for Open Contrail as well. But that is also, once again, an operational change for a lot of the, the segments that you see here. And then finally, the carrier space. Uh, obviously, that's a, a good chunk of Juniper's core business. Uh, as this discussion about hybrid cloud and you know cloud migration and and you know how do we federate these environments, a lot of even these non-carrier segments come to us and say, well, you guys understand the carrier space. As the enterprise tries to do IT as a service, and, and the big banks tell us this a lot, they really need to think like carriers. They need to support things like multi-tenancy. They need to essentially build back different business units based on usage, which the cloud providers are doing as well. But this is sort of a new concept. So as IT moves from a cost center 
to carrying a P&L and charging back each of the development teams or each of the business, it's a pretty big business model change. And obviously the cloud providers, many in the cloud industry will say cloud is more of a business model than it is a technology. There are some very distinct things in terms of the level of user empowerment, the ability to go to a self-service portal and get resources on demand that is, uh, you know, without filing a trouble ticket, that is a very big change. One of the things that I think uh, is a key tenant from a control perspective is not to reinvent the wheel in terms of how networks are done. Um, and this, this slide obviously is a fairly high level slide, but this notion of number one, workload mobility, whether it's within clusters or across data centers or across different ty types of cloud environments. This was a design principle from day one, and a lot of the thinking around the standards work that went into Contrail with L3 VPN end systems was to essentially not break what's already working. Um, so L3 VPNs and BGP peering has been in large scale networks for some time. If you look at what folks like Google Compute Engine are doing, the reason that they can spin up 200 instances in less than uh, 30 seconds is because they've distributed a lot of the technology. Now obviously they're running 300,000 servers per data center um, and, their, and their applications are maybe somewhat more monolithic uh, and greenfield than some of the large enterprises, some of the large banks who have mainframes still in their infrastructure. However, that simplicity and that level of automation is something that we're taking a page out of the book at the same time from the large scale carriers as well as the largest of the cloud builders. And we believe that there's very few architectures that are kind of finding that balance between how the emerging cloud builders are doing it to keep the agility and support new applications and things like Docker containers uh, from the beginning, but also in a way that day one ties into the existing physical networks. So we can peer directly in a, in a VPN directly with the existing layer three gateway that's already there, whether it's a Juniper MX or a Cisco ASR, you know, 9K or someone else's router. I think uh, when we started this journey with, with Contrail, uh, from the beginning, we saw OpenStack as the project in the industry that had the most momentum. It was still obviously uh, fairly early on in the days of OpenStack, and Neutron or Quantum at the time was not the central discussion. Now I think what you're seeing in a lot of the boffs and discussions around Neutron is that the networking model needs to get to the point for these large scale systems. Um, and the networking discussions are actually quite different than they were in the early days of quantum. We're not talking about L2 adjacency as the answer anymore. We're talking about how do we do distributed routing? How do we do uh, multiple service chaining? How do we do uh, you know, very distributed policy enforcement for very dynamic policies that can't be loaded statically up front? Now, the, the networking problems obviously are, are one piece, but the system level sort of challenge with a software stack is something that I, I think you know OpenStack has done a very good job. For many of our more network-centric type customers, they've asked us to, to play a bigger role in looking at the system overall, uh, the components of the stack, um, the architecture around it, the best practices, et cetera. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But in the middle, yes, there's this notion of not just the Neutron component, but the entire software stack as a binary that gets loaded in. At the end here, a lot of the best practices in terms of how do you actually rack and stack this? How do you deploy it? In what order do you do upgrades? How do you troubleshoot the physical and virtual network? There's a lot of questions still in the networking industry as this transition happens. And once again, you know, when Juniper acquired Contrail in, in December of 2012, I think the benefit that we had as, as Juniper was that we had a fairly software-centric mindset with Junos. We had a real-time kernel, we had a modular operating system, we had a, uh, a very good cadence in terms of new software delivery and the quality of the code. And that's allowed us to essentially take uh, you know, the, the best of what we can do as a broader company while not tying in any hard way to Junos, loosely coupling, but at the system level we can show a lot of the benefits. Now the reality in a lot of our Contrail deployments today is that we've deployed in production in completely mixed vendor environments, both from a switching perspective, from a routing perspective, and from a services appliance perspective. 
Um, the architecture was defined that way, and this is uh, more than three years ago that one of our Contrail co-founders, Pedro Marx, first defined and uh, co-authored in the IETF the L3 VPN end systems draft with AT&T, Verizon, and other large players. And the problem that they were trying to solve was to define a vendor agnostic uh, architecture and software that would solve the issues in a virtualized data center around multi-tenancy, access control, and workload mobility. Now, a lot of the paradigms that you'll see in the data models that we use, et cetera, come from a mobility mindset. And in this case, we're not talking about wireless .1x clients. We're talking about virtual machines that may move from one cluster to another or across clouds. But IP has solved that problem. And we take forward a lot of those learnings in, in the Contrail architecture. At the beginning, when we showed this slide, it was really to reinforce the fact that we um, have abstracted at various layers and we could support any hypervisor. We could run it on any x86 uh, Linux environment. Uh, we could support any encapsulation. Now, I, I think what I wanted to update folks here with is that we have implemented on various hypervisors. We started with KVM. We've done Zen uh, with other sort of stacks. We've uh, implemented ESXi with the vRouter implementation now. Um, and we've also done a lot with bare metal and Linux container environments without a hypervisor. Because as many of you know, the Googles and the Facebooks of the world don't use hypervisors. So we're serving a lot of these web-centric type customers who essentially are not solving the same IT problem that many of the traditional enterprise were. And they found a way to solve the segmentation problem and still get the effect of pooled resources across compute and storage without the hypervisor. That's why so much attention around Docker. Um, once again, I think there's a lot of FUD out there that we only work with uh, sort of a, a Juniper hardware and software infrastructure. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of our early deployments kind of prove from the customer perspective that this absolutely works. We've even started sharing some of the configs for non-Juniper gear in terms of the best practices, both on the layer three gateway side as well as uh, the switching architectures. Um, I, I think the other piece is that from the beginning, a lot of the intellectual property was around, in order to enable system level automation, the control plane needed to be well defined. And in the early days of SDN, there was probably a disproportionate amount of discussion around what is the encapsulation. Um, today, we support many different types. We started with GRE uh, because that's pervasively supported. Today, we will support uh, you know, the tunnel fabric over UDP. Um, we will support uh, VXLAN. We see sort of a roadmap as this evolves. Obviously, there are some that are looking at MPLS over MPLS. The piece that, of MPLS, obviously, that we retain is the 20-bit label to identify the virtual network. Um, and obviously, as, as we've seen, and I think there was a recent SDN blog by one of the, quote, founders of SDN, Scott Schenker, where he also reinforced that SDN2 should not reinvent the goodness of uh, what we've learned to do with things like MPLS. Um, but we have to solve the new problem. We have to do it in a way that we can drive rapid adoption without waiting another three years for protocols to be pervasive in the network. Um, the, the segmentation problem, I think, in the, in the Contrail architecture, the concept of VLANs goes away, and the segmentation is this notion of virtual networks, which used to be maybe somewhat expensive when tied to physical hardware, and a software architecture actually quite unlimited. So you can define a virtual network in a way that's relevant from an application and user context perspective and make that the model of segmentation. Um, you can have any, you know, many different slices of virtual networks and enforce policies based on those abstractions. And as I mentioned, we had co-authored the group-based policy blueprint within OpenStack uh, probably over a year and a half ago, uh, really trying to balance this, how do we address some of the, you know, host level enforcement issues but uh, simplify a lot of the policy administration so that it's logically centralized, but uh, glo uh, distributed uh, enforcement. That also means that from a security perspective, you hear a lot about micro-segmentation and the ability to do a distributed firewall in the Linux kernel. We already support those models from the beginning of tenant isolation uh, you know, down to the Linux kernel with the vRouter. Um, and it's, not, it's, it's partially from an application optimization perspective with things like localized QoS. It's, uh, from the other side, uh, a, a very good way of doing distributed security enforcement, uh, whether it's blocking certain types of traffic, uh, you know, inspecting before, uh, before allowing, et cetera. Um, 
I think the other thing that ma has made uh, it possible to move into deployments quickly is that we keep the expectations of the physical switching infrastructure uh, relatively straightforward, like the large cloud uh, players. We expect any-to-any -any IP connectivity in an in a IP fabric. Um, obviously, not everybody has built a CLOS fabric Google-style data center. Um, and as we make that transition with many of our, let's say, enterprise customers, obviously we can support the Contrail architecture, but many of them are moving to that type of ECMP CLOS-style fabric. Because now, with the web loads, you're not keeping 80% of the traffic within a VLAN anymore. If you look at Amazon and Google and the patterns of their traffic, even you know, Hadoop clusters, we're now uh, obviously in a very distributed model, um, and they're constantly uh, you know, moving east-west traffic. So if you look at a lot of the video analytics companies, the gaming companies, they're really excited about this notion of running uh, essentially a localized routing table so they can do a local lookup and move from one host to another without some central bottleneck. That's also been um, a lot of the issue with uh, um, you know, some of the alternative solutions where they have software gateways which not only add cost and complexity uh, but also are putting an extra bottleneck in the network infrastructure. So with obviously an optimized layer three type fabric, we're trying to reduce the number of hops uh, so that these real-time applications can uh, take advantage of an efficient network. I mentioned kind of the reference architecture approach. A lot of that has to do in, with not just the technology itself. A lot of the challenges of OpenStack even are uh, in the provisioning, in the troubleshooting, in the correlation between the physical side and the virtual side. Um, understanding is it an application problem? Is it a network problem? Is it a storage problem, et cetera? So the goodness of OpenStack and converging the IT systems is one piece. We were hearing again and again that the network guys are losing visibility. They can't ping a VM, they can't do a trace route, they can't do a packet capture, they can't uh, essentially understand aggregate throughput and flows for virtual machines within a virtual network. That's the type of thing that I think uh, you know, we, we've, we've really focused on with the analytics, uh, with the troubleshooting, with the reference architectures, et cetera. And we work with, obviously, many different partners uh, in this journey. Um, the, the fact that we've open sourced our code, we've made our you know, bug tracking uh, fully available to our partners, we've uh, put all, all of our test scripts and our documentation out there has helped us essentially not only engage our customers, but also just as importantly engage some of our technology ecosystem partners. And the rate at which we're moving with these releases uh, probably every six to eight weeks is definitely an agile software development cycle. If you look at a lot of the you know, empowerment of the user concept that was a big thread in mobility, the cloud user is king. He, he or she gets to do what they want, when they want, from a self-service portal, and it's served up immediately. At the same time, the folks that are essentially going to be, let's say, the tenants of a virtual private cloud are the folks that are developing applications and maybe network services for NFE, and they want to be able to access the infrastructure and go live without a lot of uh, uh, overhead in terms of IT and administration. So this next role of the cloud administrator uh, is, is really important in terms of uh, upfront setting what those policies are. We worked with one major um, you know, SaaS provider who from the beginning of the engagement gave us about 40 application and user templates that needed to be enforced in the overlay and with the physical network. Um, those included network and security policies, things like load balancing policies, uh, you know, they have a three-tier web application type architecture. Uh, you know, the back-end database should not be talking directly to port 80 traffic. If you see that, block it. All port 80 traffic should go through the web server tier. Those types of high-level rules can be enforced or defined up front and then enforced at the time of the transaction. I, I think, uh, you know, we, we are obviously a, a, a software team of, uh, with deep networking knowledge. And so understanding this broader problem and then bringing back to empower the network guy to do the troubleshooting, understand what's going on in the physical and virtual network. I'll talk through some of the demos. One of the things that we're showing here is uh, essentially how do you do correlation uh, across the physical and virtual topologies? How do you do topology discovery with LLDP so that if something goes wrong, you can quickly identify which flows with which VMs to which port in the switch, et cetera. And that's not, obviously, that's a vendor agnostic problem. Um, some of the key capabilities from a Contrail perspective 
it's not that these services are new services. The way that they're being applied is quite new. Um, you know, we do IPAM, DNS, and DHCP in the vRouter. If a customer has, obviously, uh, that in an existing, they can apply it. But in many cases, localizing some of these capabilities is, is much more efficient and much more scalable um, and, and allows more portability as well. Um, Initially, and there was, there's still ongoing discussion about, uh, you know, in a uh, host-level Linux kernel, uh, how much routing and switching we, we need to be doing. I think what we can say is that we see more and more of these real-time emerging applications. The level of native layer 3 capabilities that is going into the host is increasing. Um, you know, we have a local video analytics company in Mountain View, California that was recently acquired. Uh, they're running essentially BGP in every host, and they did that essentially for video latency reasons. Uh, and then they had a, a fairly large issue in terms of how to efficiently distribute the routes and avoid full route prefix uh, population down in the, in the host level. I think we've balanced that. We only populate essentially the route prefixes in the vRouter for uh, the relevant, in the locally relevant uh, workloads. And that's obviously using a page out of the book of MPLS VPNs. Once again, a lot of the problem that folks were trying to solve was to federate uh, you know, many different sub-networks with a common architecture. And now we're seeing that a lot in cloud. You know, Amazon's not going away. OpenStack private clouds are not going away. This needs to work over a common uh, network infrastructure. We also focus a lot on things like service chaining. Uh, the network control plane that we use obviously is very consistent. So when we insert either a physical or a, a virtual uh, service, we essentially next top route to it. Um, and that allows us to be extremely flexible in the types of services that we can insert. Uh, but it also allows us to define a policy once and then just change the configuration model as new uh, services are inserted. And as OpenStack continues to evolve with things like load balancing as a service, um, and those APIs uh, get, get tighter in terms of definition, obviously we'll, uh, we'll support more of those. Today we're already supporting things like LBAS APIs for HA proxy. We're working obviously on things like physical F5s as well as uh, virtual F5s. Uh, there's some of those demos being shown. Um, a lot of the def definition comes with the understanding of how this architecture was done and you know, the balance between what's distributed and what's uh, centralized and how we build a sort of scale-out infrastructure. There is no upper bound. Um, so uh, you know, some of the sort of uh, scaling demos that we're showing, in, in the broader discussions around Neutron, there was some discussion about the fact that once you get to 200 nodes, the network conks out. Well. You know, in, in a Contrail infrastructure, I think some of the demos were showing, you know, a thousand V routers for a thousand nodes and still not hitting any type of scaling limitation. Um, the other piece, and, and this is something that we've learned, you know, with uh, routing, uh, large routing systems, which is probably the largest distributed system that's out there, um, is that you can't have a single point of failure. And when you lose any single node, you can't interrupt the traffic. Um, so we, we've worked a lot over the last few you know, a few months uh, in a lot of different bake-offs in a lot of different countries uh, on HA and how that works both from an OpenStack perspective as well as from a Contrail architecture perspective. I just uh, talked to, uh, you know, another network provider. They're getting way behind Open Contrail relative to some of the other SDN solutions because day one, no matter whose network it is, we can interoperate. So that's always nice to see. I mean, we, we compete in a way, but the network's job is to interconnect. So when you have another networking company who may or may not have had success in building an SDN controller come and say, well, we're going to get behind this because we just need something that works, and we need something that works with our stuff. So I mentioned the uh, enterprise problem, and it is a little bit different. You know, if you, if you think of the web guys, they have obviously a class data center today, but they don't have a lot of legacy mainframes. They don't have uh, a lot of layer two storage keep alives. Um, a lot of that is uh, a networking challenge as well. And I think we learned some time ago in IP networks, you know, when you have SNA and Token Ring and Apple Talk and DeckNet, we're not saying rip it out. What we're saying is federate those environments. Um, that's why the layer three gateways are still obviously extremely important. We can do enforcement at the first hop, or we can do enforcement if it is a native environment where we, ha where we have the Linux kernel as a vRouter already. But that is, again, a way of using the hierarchical architecture to address these different workload environments. I think OpenStack is becoming a de facto framework, at least, for how people are thinking about heterogeneous system orchestration. Uh, 
And so obviously we don't just support sort of OpenStack, but um, we're using that as a, a very good proxy on how do we essentially uh, federate these environments from a network perspective, but also anticipate uh, you know, the application changes that are going on where more and more of this will be automated. Uh, you know, one of the specific things that our carrier customers are very interested is, uh, is around network function virtualization, and we've been involved in a lot of bake-offs around that. I presented another session uh, two days ago here at the OpenStack Summit with one of our partners who has built a composite virtual network function for the 4G packet core. Um, and they had to rewrite some aspects of that application because you know, it's not enough to take a application and put it in a virtual machine and, and ship it as a virtual appliance. A lot of the legacy applications can't take advantage of a scale-out model. And so there's no reason to rip them out and try and put them into a cloud if the application obviously doesn't take advantage of an elastic architecture. Um, but many of those services do. And as we work with not only our, for instance, our own firewall service, uh, we have a scale-out caching service, uh, you know, we work with partners around load balancing, et cetera, um, that model starts to look very consistent. Um, you know, this model of creating a service template, um, defining that once, and then just instantiate it at, instantiating it as new workloads come up, allows us to essentially balance that, you know, definition with the policy application. The other thing that I mentioned we've been really working on is sort of this uh, physical to virtual interconnect. And the bare metal question uh, was one, you know, initially a lot of the uh, use cases were around virtual machines. Now increasingly they're around supporting either bare metal servers directly or Docker containers without a hypervisor. I can't tell you how many, for instance, financial services type questions come up and they say, well, we were moving from the proprietary hypervisor to the open source hypervisor and everything was going really well. Now we may just, you know, beeline straight to a Docker environment, a container environment, because our application teams are telling us that they need a Docker enabled cloud within four months. A lot of the deployments that we've done, kind of, we, we got in fairly late in the game, got through sort of a bake-off, um, and when there's a real problem, I, I think what uh, many of our customers have found is that, uh, you know, we can sort of meet the scaling and availability expectations, but address this new problem. And the way that we address things like Docker containers is exactly the way we do the segmentation and policy enforcement for virtual machines. But now instead of a tap interface, we're essentially using Linux namespaces and, uh, you know, Linux containers. Um, so there's many ways we can have a vRouter sitting on the bare metal server as a Linux kernel module. We can also uh, increasingly use the top of rack switch as a gateway. Um, you know, we're showing another demo where we're supporting OVSDB to essentially bridge a bare metal uh, segment into the top of rack switch. Not just our top of rack switch, but preferably ours. Uh, and, uh, and then once again, without, without sort of extending all the way down to the host, we can essentially, uh, you know, map it to a virtual network and enforce a policy. So the physical reality is you have lots of, uh, virtual machines in an unpredictable location or Linux containers, maybe a hundred Linux containers per host. They can be in any, any server, in any rack, in any cluster, in any data center. Uh, this architecture will still hold up. Um, the, the broader problem as this sort of evolves is um, essentially how do we also now apply some of the services uh, that the network administrators, the security administrators uh, need for compliance purposes or whatever it is. The way that we do that, as I mentioned, is, is through next hop routing. So we have a lot of flexibility in terms of how we insert a service. Uh, we create, we, we steer the traffic to that next hop, apply the service. Um, you know, traffic needs to go from virtual network red to virtual network green, but through policy it's enforced that it first has to go through a firewall service and a load balancing service. And when you change, change that firewall service from one vendor to another, the policy doesn't change, but obviously the service template may change with the new configuration parameters. As firewall as a service APIs get better, then obviously there's a common way to push the configuration down. Today we found a lot of success with the service orchestration and the service template uh, model in how people are defining that, that service chaining in, in their data center. And part of this transition, so one of the um, you know, SaaS providers that we're working with was uh, essentially using um, you know, a 
a layer two tromboning to a physical F5 load balancer. As they evolve their architecture, they're moving to a more native layer three architecture where they'll have more distributed load balancing services inserted. And, and very often that's incremental. It's not as a replacement. We have one large financial services customer that has about 3,000 security uh, virtual instances uh, in their implementation. And that doesn't displace the firewalls, the pair of firewalls that sit at the DMARC between the WAN and the data center. They're putting firewalls between tenant groups. Um, well, I, I have a snapshot here, for instance, we, we're just showing that uh, you know, we're, we're scaling to a thousand nodes and beyond with this architecture just to show we don't see this as sort of we wish we could. It's, it's something that we are actually have you know, working today uh, as, as customers scale. Uh, obviously, a lot of discussion about should we cap it at 200 nodes and just put you know, new controllers for each set of a couple hundred nodes. We don't obviously believe that's the right thing from a cost and efficiency perspective. Um, so we're doing a lot of bake-offs now. I think we, we would ask that a lot of our customers and partners hold us to you know, the data and data-driven decisions. There's been a lot of emotion and a lot of lobbying in, uh, in the open efforts. And so now we're starting to see a lot of the data. And actually, some of our customers are sharing the, uh, the test script uh, the test plans that they've done so that there can be sort of best practices on you know what are we actually testing for what do we need to sort of improve the model and the architectures uh, the other thing that I mentioned the ability to do sort of physical topology discovery uh, and then essentially map flows a uh, drill down into uh, specific ports into specific virtual machines aggregate that back up this is all you know from the very beginning as we moved into an operational environment you know, many of our customers were asking us for more guidance on uh, not just obviously the overlay piece, but the interaction with the physical underlay. Um, in terms of the Docker, um, this is something we started with a blog. Uh, we, we put more information now in, in terms of open contrail and uh, the types of requirements that we're seeing there. The Docker guys endorsed us at the last OpenStack Summit. Uh, they like the way that you know the the, uh, the networking is, is simplified, but also highly distributed. Um, you know, I think this is something that if you're looking at contrail, I encourage you to take a look at. We've shared a lot of the configurations. We have some videos out there now. Um, obviously, a lot of excitement around Docker. Uh, thanks to our, our marketing team, there's also a host of, of new demos that are being uh, put out there, which are just a couple of minutes to kind of show uh, the capabilities that we've added and some of the services partners and how they're used in, uh, uh, in, in our demos. Um, and some of those are posted on YouTube, others uh, you, you'll see show up through Open Contrail. We're trying to color that too with uh, you know, blogs by the users. So many of our customers and partners have already blogged about uh, you know, not only the uh, good experiences that they have had, but the gaps that they'd like to see us to address. This afternoon we have our Open Contrail Advisory Board meeting with many of the folks uh, here uh, at the summit. And um, you know, that discussion is both from a business side as well as a technology side, uh, aspects we're looking for active feedback around community governance around roadmap around lessons learned we've opened up some of the uh, community support to uh, folks that have already deployed what we're finding is that while the code is the same between open contrail and juniper contrail obviously the support model is is what we monetize from a juniper perspective uh, but a lot of our customers start with open contrail and they like the fact that it's an open transparent model um, they obviously want to interact with us commercially as Juniper because they're looking to scale and they want to make sure that it's supported. Uh, there's a picture of, uh, of our booth. We've had a lot of traffic through there and we, um, it got particularly busy when we hosted uh, the, uh, the beer bash. This is just a snapshot of some of the partners that we've been working with. And what we found is that both from a systems integration perspective, as well as from a layer four through seven virtual services perspective, it's been fairly easy uh, for folks to kind of interact with the Contrail architecture. Um, but I, I think we have more work to do in terms of how we're documenting, um, how we're uh, testing and, and all of that. This also just recaps. I mean, it's been uh, you know about two years now. Um, things have moved very quickly. We GA'd uh, Contrail in December of 2012, uh, actually September of 2012, as open source. And you're starting to see some SDN players open sourcing now. Um, and one of the you know key questions that we asked ourselves when we uh, started Open Contrail is you know if you don't do it when you start, 
it's very hard to do it successfully after the fact. Now that everybody has validated the model of open source, I think we will see more SDN players open sourcing. But if, if you look at you know, the way our development team uses the open source model for their own agility, um, it's, it's very hard to do it after the fact. So it, it kind of comes across as desperation when you do it too late in the game. Um, but for us, it's it obvi obviously become not only an internal uh, differentiator in, in terms of you know, how quickly we're moving with new releases, but also it's allowed some of our partners and customers to already contribute code back. Um, you know, we had a case study with CloudWatt, who's already in production. Um, they've contributed quite a bit in terms of, you know, how they're doing load balancing, how they're doing packaging, how they're doing the SSL uh, implementation, et cetera. But also just participating more broadly in meetups and, and that kind of thing. Um, so the, the base infrastructure was the first thing in terms of implementing the Layer 3 VPN and systems architecture. What we added, we, we submitted the AWS VPC API blueprint into uh, OpenStack. Um, you know, today that's obviously uh, still a, a question in terms of the extent to which OpenStack uh, embraces other cloud environments. From a network perspective, we, we have to uh, embrace that model. So the notion there was to essentially take the same virtual private cloud APIs as uh, one has in the, in the Amazon cloud, uh, run them in a private cloud in terms of OpenStack, and not change the scripts. Um, whether it's that way or through heat, heat templates and um, you know, other models, I think uh, that networking problem is definitely one that uh, we want to differentiate ourselves with. Um, I think the other thing is that a lot of our customers are testing the Contrail imp implementation against the Neutron V2 APIs. So you know, many of our customers have said you know, a, a baseline requirement is that uh, you know, we stress the Neutron V2 APIs as part of our benchmark, not just for functionality and uh, implementation of the APIs, uh, but also you know, how are you doing API versioning, how are you doing release management against those, uh, those a APIs so we can keep the architecture loosely coupled. But that was also a, a, a key issue or a key debate topic in the last panel. Um, you know, the last OpenStack Summit, a lot of folks were talking about the challenges with the default Neutron implementation to the point that folks were questioning Neutron. Um, if we start to make data-driven decisions and don't necessarily uh, take certain things for granted, I think it, it doesn't make sense to say we should do away with Neutron. It makes sense to fix the issues. Um, you know, the, the last, uh, or the first part of this year, um, we were upstreamed officially with OpenStack Juno. Uh, we kicked off the Open Contrail Advisory Board with some of our key customers like NTT and AT&T and uh, Symantec and Workday, and uh, that list is, is still growing. We're seeing uh, a lot of active involvement uh, in, in that environment. And then uh, the Contrail reference architecture, as I mentioned, we're not just sort of looking at the uh, networking piece, but the networking piece in context of the broader architecture, as well as how does this work with distributed storage. Uh, we're assuming that not everybody is uh, putting large EMC arrays into their, uh, into their clouds, et cetera. But we have to balance all of that. I mentioned the scaling, the HA testing, the correlation between physical and virtual. A lot of those things are sort of ongoing. Um, the native IPv6 implementation with the overlay was definitely a goal for us in calendar year 2014 that we hit. Um, I think there was another session, actually two sessions, on folks that actually took it upon themselves to do an open source project around a distributed sort of vRouter. Um, and I think there is sort of convergence. We like seeing those types of things uh, and, and other communities, uh, and we can kind of uh, divide and conquer with folks that have kind of, um, you know, tackled parts of that problem already. Okay, so I think I've left a little bit of time for any questions or comments. Um, open it up. Anything that uh, you didn't hear about that you wanted us to address as, as sponsors this time? Yeah, please. Just wondering, um, how are you guys actually cooperating with other um, you know, relevant uh, projects like, uh, for example, Congress or even Neutron? Is 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 kind of separate approach you guys trying to pursue now, or you guys really try to cooperate with other? Uh, related actually. Project. Well, I think they're quite different. So Neutron, we actually have a core contributor in the Contrail team for Neutron. Uh, we um, we are now a you know uh, sort of a, an official upstream Neutron plugin with the Contrail piece. So we're obviously very invested in, in Neutron. Our core contributions have been in Neutron. As far as Congress goes, um, you know this notion of uh, audit and compliance is actually something that we also take very seriously. Um, and you know as that evolves, I think we'll we'll probably be more active specifically in Congress, but the group-based policy blueprint that was three summits ago, we actually co-authored. Uh, 
So in terms of how we think about the interplay between policy uh, you know, definition in a way that's uh, you know, not so granular but abstracted up to a group uh, or a virtual network as we think of it, um, is, is definitely not a new concept. So that discussion has been going. We're, we're working with some of our you know, uh, key customers because especially like in the financial services industry, we had a very large financial services customer advisory board me meeting in New York with 18 of the major banks. And the thing that they said to us from a IT perspective is we're, we're sort of in the business of risk management. Um, so we need an SDN type efficiency model and automation, but you can't make any compromises. So if you tell me that it's not compliant, if I lose my you know, SOX compliance or if I'm a retailer and I lose my you know, PCI compliance, I'm not going to even start right now. OpenStack has this broader issue, and you've probably seen some of the security breakout teams talking about how do we uh, do OpenStack compliance. We, we'd like to take a native, uh, you know, an active role in that. A lot of our security team uh, has been working closely with some of our Contrail customers to define the cloud security audit and how we implement that with Contrail and you know, with the broader network teams. Well, yeah, we compete directly with NSX. However, uh, what I'm talking about here is the hypervisor support with ESXi. Um, and what many of our customers have said is as they move from a VMware environment to an OpenStack cloud, they want to make sure that they don't have to recertify workloads. So especially in the government industry, you see that they've certified it for an ESXi hypervisor. They want to move that virtualized workload over to an OpenStack cloud. We support that today. Um, and, you know, the... Uh, the other aspect of it is the vCenter APIs, which we're also, I think, demoing out in the booth. Um, you know, the vCenter APIs have evolved quite a bit from you know, the early days. I think you see VMware sort of uh, embracing OpenStack. So as that evolves, uh, that's you know, getting easier to support as well. But I, I think it is really about the mindset. So many of the customers who have VMware workloads today, they run quite well in VMware today. They don't necessarily need to rip those out and move them into an OpenStack environment. Where, they're, where we're seeing folks building the OpenStack cloud environment is where they need that cloud. Um, and they, they can basically you know, have a, a, you know, the new clusters come up in a native OpenStack environment. And from a network perspective, we can federate that to the you know, VMware environment quite well. If a customer wants to swing those workloads over, we're supporting that as well. OK, any other questions? Yes. So I showed one slide, and that's actually uh, you know of the differentiation. Um, those are the key ones, you know, um, in terms of scaling, in terms of service chaining, in terms of open standards-based implementation that works without extra gateways. Um, in terms of the the flexibility to pull in new services and not do a development program around integration of each service. Uh, in terms of being you know vendor agnostic. In terms of cost. Uh, in terms of agility. Uh, you know, we're hearing a lot about the, and, and I, you know, we really like the NYSERA guys. Uh, they obviously, you know, kicked off the whole quantum discussion within OpenStack. Um, VMware paid $1.2 billion for NYSERA specifically to kind of change the discussion in networking. And it, it definitely, I mean, we, we, we all, as a community, networking discussions have definitely changed. Um, you know, but I think what we're seeing from a, you know, competition point of view, um, some of our customers are sharing their results, and we, we just, you know, as that sort of matures in terms of data plane scaling, you know, control plane scaling, ability uh, to do HA, ability to insert services, cost, uh, you know, complexity, network troubleshooting, um, these kind of things, I, I, I think that will uh, get clearer over time. All right, yeah, thanks again for joining. Um, glad you found the room. <laughs> <laughs>